We are now dealing with a new step in the uh, understanding in uh, HHS and uh, electronic sensitivity and multiple chemical sensitivity characterization. That is very important because now we have objective markers, biomarkers that can be routinely uh, done, uh, tested. Since the last four years, I personally examined clinically and investigated biologically 1,216 patients which were referred as uh, who were referred as so-called electrohypersensitivity. On this, about 10% were not associated with electrohypersensitivity based on a clinical uh, examination and biological investigation. However, 90% of the uh, people were truly electrohypersensitive patients. Why? Because we had three clinical criteria that uh, I will report, and because we had biological abnormalities in the blood and in the urine of these patients. So these are really a very important step now. We have sufficient knowledge to say that uh, there are real health problems dealing with uh, electrohypersensitivity and multiple uh, chemical sensitivity, so that we have to, uh, to make some scientific pressure uh, toward WHO and other international institutions uh, for recognizing this type of disorders. So, uh, what do you think about the, the present situation? This conference is very important, uh, not just in the European countries, but internationally. Because people with electrosensitivity and multiple chemical sensitivity, uh, those populations continue to grow. People continue to become sick, particularly children now we worry about, who will go to school for perhaps 12 years in environments we have created that are artificial, that are very harmful to their health, their learning, their behavior, and ultimately their reproduction. And the passage of our essence, the human genome, down the line to their children. In the past, I think all of us as scientists have, have concentrated on gathering the evidence to say to our decision makers, there is so much evidence now, we shouldn't be ignoring it, because if we ignore it, it will become a larger and larger public health problem. And this is now a global problem. The Bioinitiative report first in 2007 and then updated five years later in 2012 continues to gather the scientific and public health evidence for these effects, and they're really now inarguable. So what is our choice? What is the next thing that we need to do? The next step is to take the science and to say, we agree it is more than sufficient to change public health standards around the world. We need biologically based public health standards, and we need them now. Not yet, we needed them yesterday, but we'll settle for, it. We'll settle for today. And we need to communicate better with decision makers now to say, you can't really afford to wait any longer. Economically, in terms of education, in terms of health, this is too costly because it's a global problem. So what I hope from this conference is that people will now approach the World Health Organization and get the proper categorization of EHS and MCS as medical syndromes or diseases that need to be recognized so we can move on with treatment, we can move on with education. And it's also my hope that the United Nations will accept our resolutions and our declarations because we are really talking about human health rights, the right to health, the right to natural environmental cues that regulate our bodies, the right to sleep, the right to heal, the right to reproduce are all issues that are negatively affected by environmental levels that we have today from 
wireless technologies. So my hope is that this group of scientists and public health experts will move forward hand in hand with good communicators um, and advocacy groups to talk with decision makers and to move very, very rapidly for improvements in public health standards. Well, I, I agree with everything that Cindy just said. And I think I'd like to expand a little bit on what I see as one of the critical issues, and that is the use of Wi-Fi classrooms in schools. When you have a router and a classroom with 10 or 20 children on wireless laptops, you have a, a situation where there is an enormous a level of radio frequency radiation in that room. Now, we know from the studies of people that have become electrosensitive that often there is an initiating exposure, a high level of exposure, that triggers the development of the electrohypersensitivity syndrome. And it appears that in almost all circumstances, once a person becomes electrosensitive, that continues for life. They may not be ill if they're not around the electromagnetic fields, but when they become close to the electromagnetic fields, they become ill. And the illness is reflected as headaches, fatigue, mental dullness, irritability, and a, a general reduction of ability to function. So not only are children more vulnerable to every environmental exposure, but if we allow our children in schools where they're supposed to be learning to be exposed to an agent that reduces their ability to pay attention and to learn and promotes illness, this is a tragedy, it's foolish, and we should act right there to reduce exposure. Exposure comes from other sources as well, but that is perhaps the most obvious step that we could take immediately. When a, a wired computer classroom will not result in exposure, will have the same access to the internet with every child needs. But to rush ahead and make everything wireless without contemplating the long-term health effects is unwise. I just remember in the early 1980s when I was at the very first meeting regarding electrohypersensitivity, and that was in Sweden. It was underground in an ice-cold bicycle shed. We were freezing, I really tell you. And there were a few people around, and we felt very, very lonely. And we kept on feeling quite lonely for a number of years. Uh, the interest wasn't that great, but today I'm invited here at the Royal Academy of Medicine in Brussels, which is an enormous honor, and that tells you a lot. It speaks a lot. And since I'm from the Karolinska Institute, if I could, I would give all these guys here a collective Nobel Prize, because they have done wonders, I must say, you know, and uh, they are working for mankind, and that is the first sentence in Alfred Nobel's testimony. Uh, so that is what he pressed on, that people should work for the benefit of mankind, and these people have really done that. Thank you. It's almost to, op uh, to open the already open doors, to reinforce the necessary t necessity to to, I would say, to ban the wireless uh, internet communications in schools. I see this as the rising big problem for human health. Authorities say, say that the exposure is within the ICNIP guidelines, and we know that the ICNIP guidelines do not take care of long-term effects or uh, of um, non-thermal effects, that's to say, in, uh, the effects we can see which are not depending on, on tissue heating. I think uh, we need quite a lot of education of the society. What is this about? We need to educate the medical profession because doctors and other working in the medical profession are mostly unaware of these health problems and think that um, the exposure is not, no, not a problem. I would also say that, um, which has been clearly shown this morning that electrohypersensitivity is there as a medical diagnosis. We have to go fur further and establish the criteria for this uh, disease or this uh, syndrome 
so that it's given a WHO international classification of disease code. And when we establish an ICD code for electrohypersensitivity, then uh, the door will at least open a little in the medical profession to acknowledge this uh, disease and from that to go on for treatment. But we need to have more information about uh, the diagnosis of this criteria, which is not that easy as we have heard, and also to have uh, Ad advise how to treat these patients. Uh, we will hear this afternoon about Professor Belpom's uh, medical or uh, biological markers for the disease, which is a large step forward to try to establish diagnostic criteria. I think one, one point about the uh, bioelectromagnetics community is that that's dominated by engineers and physicists, not by health professionals. And the engineering community uh, is really the community that developed the thermal standard to start with. So uh, they're not the people that have expertise appropriate for identifying uh, human health effects. So there are actually three issues, uh, the cancers, the reproductive problems, and the symptoms of electrical hypersensitivity that are all influenced by our exposure to electromagnetic fields. And there's plenty of science to document that, both at the low frequencies and at the radio frequencies. And I think most of the people here want to prevent that from happening. They want to prevent people from becoming ill. Their quality of life diminishes so much. Um, and so if we can protect children to begin with uh, and improve everyone's uh, standard of, of health care, uh, I think this is what we're all aiming for. The comment is about uh, the IARC decision in uh, 2011 uh, to classify radio frequencies as a, a possible human carcinogen group 2B and um, based on brain tumor risk. And after that, uh, the evidence, I would say, has increased even, so we could say that it's probable human carcinogen, which some scientists around the world propagate for class 2A. So the bottom line is, if there's something that is at least a possible human carcinogen, why are we exposing uh, our children to that? and where we don't know the long-term effects. There are no children that have been exposed uh, for uh, 12 years and who have been followed up to 70 or 80 years, what uh, the time life uh, would be. So I think this is, uh, this is a horrifying uh, situation in, in the schools uh, in many countries by now.